Welcome to Circuit 42. Circuit 42. The one-stop location for all things geek. This episode is brought to you by our sponsors, Dragon's Lair San Antonio and Gotham Newsstand. Sit back, relax, and most importantly, enjoy another episode of Circuit 42. Circuit 42. My name is Ian McIntosh from Circuit 42, and welcome to the newest episode of Pass the Popcorn. I am here with special guest and wearer of many hats, Ken Pontac. Hello. Hello, Ken. So, for those five people on the internet, those sick, sad people stuck in their corner of obscurity who don't know who you are, who are you and what do you do? Well, as you said, I am Ken Pontac. And um, I'm an animation uh, writer, director, um, producer. Um, I've written comic books, video games, uh, dropped out of art school, uh, been an art director. Um, I wear a lot of hats. What is the most recent hat that you've worn, or maybe the most well-known hat that you've worn? Um, the most recent hat that I've Warren is uh, is probably um, writer, um, writer for other people's projects. Um, I've been a hired gun who has been fortunate enough to work on um, a lot of interesting and well-known projects. Um, Happy Tree Friends, of course, um, being probably the best known one, if, if not the best known, at least the the most eyeballs. <laughs> um, I think that we are now. Actually, I know that we are now in the billion hit club um so violent that we're banned in russia and um we uh after a couple year hiatus just came up with uh five new episodes last year which are available on the mondo media site uh besides that um i think the first major cultural icon that i worked on uh, was gumby um back in the 80s and probably the most recent and well-known cultural icon that I've worked on is uh, probably, oh, Sonic the Hedgehog. Um, although I worked on a show on Netflix called Kong, King of the Apes, uh, and a lot of people know who King Kong is, too. I actually got to see uh, Kong recently. Regarding, I got to say, regarding Sonic Boom and the issues people have had with that King <laughs> franchise... Your yeah. part is definitely the strongest part of that game, and apparently you were the only one who put a decent amount of time into it. So, rock on well, there. Yeah. <laughs> it's, um, it's certainly a controversial uh, portion of my career. Yeah, but you know what? When you're the good part, you're doing okay. Thank you. Yeah, it's... Um, uh, yeah, the, the, Sonic, uh, the Sonic fans are a... Um, Passionate and vocal crowd. The Sonic fans... Okay, I'm, 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 I'm going to get myself in so much trouble. The Sonic <laughs> fans are a weird bunch. Because it's like... It's like, we get it. Half of you are extremely nostalgic. Half of you, I don't want to look up your artwork on the internet. But, um... It's a cartoon game primarily made for children. And in this regard... It's not, I, I, I'm a quasi-Sonic fan because I'm able to distance myself from the otter and more extreme corners. And having worked in Sonic, you probably, or, you probably know of and try to avoid those corners as best as possible. But I look at it this way. We, even back in the first Sonic projects, there has been disappointment because come on, everybody remembers Adventures of Sonic and Hedge, uh, Adventures of the Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog, which was basically a cartoon on meth. <laughs> you know, I'd be proud to have anything that I worked on be called something on meth, and and I believe I actually have had certain things I've worked on called that. So no, but a bad version. Oh, bad, bad meth! I didn't know there was such a thing. Yeah, it's, it mainly comes <laughs> out of. Um, Mainly comes out of New Mexico to Playboy, Colorado. Yeah, right. And parts of Mesa, Arizona. I used to live in Mesa, Arizona, so there you are. We had a storage unit that actually got shut down because the owners, not somebody with a unit, but the owners were making meth in their storage units. Well, I live in Sausalito, California, 
um, which is a um, a very tony and well-to-do place full of um, rich white people. Yeah. Uh, live in a condominium. And um, some years ago, uh, one of the units around the corner uh, was shut down because there was a meth lab in the kitchen. So um, wow. <laughs> meth knows no borders. Oh, yeah. By the way, have you realized the kind of show that you are on now? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I do now. Meth knows no boundaries, apparently. <laughs> meth knows no boundaries here at Circuit 42. <laughs> yeah, we, we got to the meth really fast. Yep, we sure did. Hashtag Breaking Bad. Um, yeah. There was a um, a person at Fan Expo in Dallas that just says uh, Walter White. And the mm-hmm. guy legit just looked like Brian Cranston. I know it wasn't him because he wasn't wearing a big rubber mask. But I couldn't help it. Right as he was walking by me, I just had to yell, Science, bitch! Nice. And just five, I actually had the, pleasure of working. I had the pleasure of working with Brian Cranston um, really? some years ago on a uh, TV series called Gary and Mike. Huh, I, and, uh, he I played did um, Gary Mike. Gary's dad. Was this animated or live action? Because he's done a uh, lot of both. Stop motion animated series uh, done in Portland by uh, Will Vinton Studios back when there was a Will Vinton Studios that didn't then turn into Leica. Yeah. And uh, it was uh, it was a really fun show to work on. I, I uh, directed, I don't know, I think it was three and a half episodes or four and a half episodes uh, of the show. Uh, we ran for, I think, 13 episodes and ended on uh, a total Thelma and Louise cliffhanger and then didn't get picked up, so... As far as I know, the boys are still suspended in the air over the cliff in their uh, in their little station wagon or whatever they were driving. I just like to assume it was an RV. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't an RV. It was uh, it was it was a total junker. It yeah. was a really good show. If you haven't seen it, um, it's uh, YouTube. Gary and Mike. Um, Gary and Mike. Look up the episode called Fish Fry, which is um, one of the ones that I directed. Um, it won an Emmy for Best Art Direction that year. Um, I have seen the show. Oh, you have? Yes. I actually saw this one. It was on UPN. Yes, yes. Yeah, like somebody was actually watching UPN, I know. <laughs> yeah, great show to work on. Really, really great people, um, good times. It was uh, it was a, a year of my life well spent. Yes, I actually distinctly remember the show, and now we kind of need to go back and watch all these episodes. But mm-hmm. uh, the, thing I love, the thing I love about Grant is the fact that, like, that guy, he's not one of these actors who tries to forget the early stuff that he did. Not regarding this, but regarding things like Power Rangers and a lot of the voice dubbing he did for anime. I mean, the fact that he came back to play Zordon, it's like, rock on, dude. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, because he played Zordon. He, no, no, he didn't play Zordon. Um, no, he didn't play Zordon in the original. He was the voice of a number of the aliens, like in the English dubs. And he, the reason he came and did Zordon was because Power Rangers was one of the first big projects that he did back in the day. Wow. Yeah. He did That's it. the thing I learned today. Right? We've all learned something here at Circuit 42. It's a moral <laughs> today. But um, something I actually wanted to talk to you about. Because there is something that you did that became, at least when it came out, it it be it quickly became very, I guess meme worthy would be the way to describe it, and that was the "You Are a Pirate" song from Lazy Town. Oh yeah, that thing. Because like I was twenty when that came out, and for me that was the greatest scene in the world. <laughs> yeah, I um, I went to Iceland for a month to work on Lazy Town. Uh, I don't even remember when I did that. Um, I uh, it's it's look upable. Um, and uh, the first thing that they did is they gave me a, a script that had already been through a couple of drafts, um, a pirate adventure. And um, I am deeply into pirates. Um, some years ago, I said to a friend of mine, uh, "I finally bought the last piece of my pirate." costume and he said why in the world would anybody want to buy a pirate costume because it's awesome duh well because it's awesome but also my answer was so i don't have to keep renting pirate costumes 
and now I have three pirate costumes, and you know I That's I wear really cool. cons and stuff and and all that. But this is before I had my full pirate costume. But I was deeply into pirates, and um, every show had to have a song. Every episode had, had to have a song, and so um, the um, the composer gave me um, a scratch track that had the basic melody on it. Um, you know, da 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 da. You know the melody. Everybody knows the melody. Yeah, um, and I would just play it. Um, I would play it as background music day and night. I would fall asleep listening to it and wake up with it still playing. And uh, I did that for about three days. And then all of a sudden, just out of the blue, the lyric, um, do what you want because a pirate lives free, kind of. You are a pirate. Exactly. It crystallized in my brain. And the rest of the song just sort of grew around that night. I, I knew I had it at that moment. Um, and, you know, the song came up great and i was very happy with it i I wasn't even around when they recorded it um and so you know time went by because it takes a while between the time that you write something to the time that it ends up on the air and it was about a year later and i i kind of thought to myself i wonder whatever happened with that pirate song i wonder if it's on youtube (laughs) And (laughs) and i just went Holy fucking shit, what? <laughs> See, he because realizes he hopefully... could say those words on the show. Oh, yeah, instant. I, I got that real quick. Um, <laughs> and and I couldn't believe it. I mean, you know, you, you know what it was or and is, and, and this was this is years ago. Yeah. Um, and there was one site that they, they actually took down. Um, the Lacetown people took it down. Um, but in its heyday, I think it got up to, like, 30 some million hits mm-hmm. uh, just on, on, you know, this one, this one posting. Then there was like, you know, all the other ones that had 5 million hits here and, you know, this many million here and, you know, 200,000 there, you know, and people doing the karaoke versions and, and the mashups and everything. And I just, I thought, God, I, I created something bigger than myself. Lazy Town was just an oddball show. Cause I don't, because somehow the internet just found out about Lazy Town, and that show got just really, really popular with all the what the hell, why is this popular to you people? Yeah, yeah, it's definitely one of those those shows for little kids and college college stoners. Yeah, pretty much. It's like HR, you know, it's it's that generation's HR Papa stuff, which was kind of the stoner show when I was a kid. And considering the shows you've considering the shows you've created or had a hand in. You can, I can definitely see the connection there. Ah, yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure, for sure. As a matter of fact, I vaguely remember hearing that um, Sid and Marty Croft uh, were fans of Bump in the Night. When, I wanted uh, to talk about that show because that show was freaking amazing. It was yeah, so man. weird, but I loved it. Yeah, what do you want to talk about? Well, I just want to talk to you about the history of it, man. Like, How did that come about? Because it was so different from anything else that was on Saturday morning. And unlike most of the stuff that was on ABC... It was interesting. So there's sort of a direct lineage um, that starts with uh, me and my uh, my buddy uh, David Ichioka, um, who back then was David Blyman. Um, uh, we were pals uh, from uh, like first grade on, and um, we you know we started making uh, movies together, uh, movies uh, short films. And um, we did a clay animation film in Art Center with um, my uh, roommate at the time, a guy named Kevin Mack, who yeah. uh, you should look that guy up because he's uh, he's basically been the effects director for a third of every, you know, monster and effects and alien film you've seen for the past 15 years. Um, and Is it, uh, Kevin Scott Mack? Kevin Scott Mack, yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, he's, uh, he's quite a character. Um, amazing guy. And um, so anyway, we made this clay animated film, and um, and uh, one thing led to another, and Art Clokey uh, saw it, and um, because he saw that film, I ended up being the art director for Gumby, and really got kind of got to be a stop motion guy, and then um, David and I uh, finished Gumby, and we pitched this uh, stop motion call- show called The Danger Team to. Um, to the networks and it ended up, up as a pilot on ABC. And this is the, lo- the very long version of how um, Bump on the Night came about. And um, the pilot didn't go anywhere. And uh, 
and it was kind of disappointing. And we ended up in um, being invited to the New Art Theater, which is an art kind of an art house theater in um, Los Angeles, um, to be part of a panel about uh, primetime animated shows because the Danger Team was supposed to be a primetime animated show, yeah. and we we thought. God, do we really want to go there and, and be? We're going to be the only guys who actually have done it and failed. This this guy Matt Groening has got this new show called The Simpsons. <laughs> it's going to be be going somewhere and I can never a, went anywhere. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? What a fucking loser! Um, I think it was thirty years this year or something. It's crazy. Um, good God, that means that, that this story I'm telling happened thirty years ago. Um, and um, and then there's a show called Fish Police and Family Dogs. So anyway, Fish we, we, yeah, really, yeah, yeah, that was a while ago. Good memory. Um, so we decided that we'd go there because what the hell, you know, you don't. Nothing happens if you stay at home crying in your beer. Mm -hmm. So we went out there and we got on stage and told our story. And in the audience was a uh, woman named Jenny Trias, who happened to be the um, VP in charge of children's programming at ABC. Mm. And she approached David and myself and she said. Um, I really like the, what you did on the Danger Team and, and, you know, the stuff on Gumby. And I, I like the fact that you say that you can do it, you know, pretty cheap and fast. And I would love to have you pitch a show. And we said, sure. And back then, you know, it was a different world. Um, there were only like really three or four places to pitch a show, ABC, CBS, NBC, and Fox. Um, and pitching was seasonal instead of, you know, now you pitch whenever you get a meeting. Back then there were like two pitch seasons. And so we had like three or four months, maybe half a year, until we could pitch Bump in the Night. And so uh, David and I had basically slunk back from Hollywood to um, to work on Clay Fighter um, at the time uh, that we got this meeting. And so we, we uh, used some of the people that were working on Clay Fighter to do some sculpts for this character, Mr. Bumpy and Squishy. And... Um, Basically, we decided it would be, you know, the monster that lived under the bed, and, you know, you know what Bump of the Night was. Yeah. And we get into uh, to Jenny, and she loved it. Um, at least I think she loved it. She said, she said, um, okay, I love this. Um, let's do it. Have your people talk to my people. Um, and all of a sudden, we basically sold a show in the room. Um, when I say that I'm not sure that she actually loved it, is that I found out later that she had been told by her superiors that... Um, ABC was looking for shows that instead of a show that somebody brought in that they would then license but not own, that they could buy and then own, which they did. Uh, David and I happily sold, you know, our first child um, into slavery for the, the opportunity to actually have a show on the air. So we sold Bump in the Night to ABC. Another thing that they wanted was a show that um, looked different than other shows, and Bump in the Night looked different than anything. There wasn't a stop-motion um, series on the air um, at that point. The only thing around was Gumby um, in syndication. And they also wanted something that could be done reasonably quickly and cheaply, which we kind of did, but um, we we ended up costing a little, little bit more than they expected. I but, was going to uh, say, that show did not look cheap. Yeah, yeah. It um, All the money ended up on the screen, too. I mean, it, it, it cost as much as a, kind of a high-end um, Saturday morning show. Um, but it wasn't ridiculously expensive. It was still done pretty darn cheaply. Uh, I, I honestly, I, I'm not being quiet. I totally forget how much it cost uh, per episode. I think maybe three hundred thousand per episode back then, or something, um, which is I think a little higher than the going rate back in the day. And I'm kind of pulling that number out of my ass. Math is not my strong point. Um, but uh, that's that's how Bump and I got on the air, and. So that's sort of the how it got on the air part. But as far as the characters and stuff, um, I think this story kind of sums it up the best because Mr. Bumpy is basically me. Um, and when the show aired uh, on the first Saturday, my mom called me up at home and she said, uh, Jesus, Ken, you've been drawing that thin thing since you were seven years old, um, <laughs> which was more or less true. Um, and because I'm a smart ass and, and have to twist a knife into my mom on the day of my greatest victory. I said, yeah, yeah. And remember how you used to tell me to stop drawing monsters and, and draw something pretty like a horse or a vase full of flowers? And and she was suitably <laughs> busted. Um, and uh, and that, that is uh, how we 
that's the story behind Mr. Bumpy, basically. At least that part of the story. Yeah, it's interesting because I distinctly remember the two shows I distinctly remember from ABC Saturday morning because I used to watch those as a kid, and then when it kind of when I noticed that the shows were kind of disappearing, I started moving over to Fox. But then, because I remember the late eight, late eighties, early nineties, I kind of had their Saturday morning thing with the after these messages, we'll be right back. Yeah, you know, they right. had that. And then it kind kind of stale, so I went over to the Fox with my like, X Men and all that. And then I remember when this and Crypt Keeper came out, and it's like, wait, what? These are weird. And I started going back as a kid and watching those instead, because it was either that or Bobby's World, and I really ah. didn't want to watch. Even as a kid, I knew I didn't want to watch Bobby's World. What was Crypt Keeper? I don't remember that at all. Crypt Keeper was the animated Tales from the Crypt series that they did. Oh, okay. Where a what? lot of them would end up like implying that they killed the kids, and I was a twisted kid, so I would like be like, "Hell yeah, I'll watch that. That sounds awesome." You know, I loved that era. Um, the very first animated show I ever wrote on, except I wrote one episode of Gumby. I hardly even count that because it was just clueless and weird. It was a cool episode. So it was called... so it's Gumby. Gumby. The Gumby was the first animation script I ever got paid to write. Um, it was an episode called Time Out. Um, but the first one I wrote when I kind of had a clue about what I was doing uh, was an episode of Mighty Max. Mm-hmm. And the reason that I wrote for Mighty Max is that Mark Zaslov, who was a story editor on Mighty Max, uh, was chosen by ABC to become the story editor for Bump in the Night. And between the time that we sold Bump in the Night and the time that we started producing it and I started getting paid for it, was there was a period of time between those two events. And I needed money. And so I said to Mark, hey, Mark, we're going to be working together anyway. Um, can you give me a job? Um, and he said, sure, write, write for Mighty Max, which was really fun. But the thing that I'm getting at is, you know, you're talking about the kids in, you know, implicitly dying. Yeah. My episode, I basically had my character, uh, Raven Dark, the, the Viking, evil Viking sorcerer, played by Jim Cummings, who I did not know at the time was going to become the voice of Mr. Pumpy. I was going to and- say, he worked with Jim and Rob a lot. And, and Rob Paulson, who was the voice of Mighty Max, who I didn't know I was going to be working with, I had no idea who these guys were, um, I had Raven Dark commit suicide. Only oh. blood will, 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 will end the curse. And, and Mighty Max, and Max says, I, the blood mobile was at my school last week. And Raven Dark says, not your blood, my blood. And he picks up the ceremonial knife, and he turns it towards himself. And I think there's even a couple of frames that moving towards him, and then you cut away. But the inference, dangerous and imitable and impossible to do now in any animated series I know of, um, was that he fucking killed himself. Yeah. And you could do that back then. Um, And I was going to say, and look, the world isn't fucked up, but you know what? Uh Uh-oh, the world is fucked up. (laughs) Maybe maybe I am partly to blame for decisions that were made even today. Um, Are you saying that you're to blame for the election of orange pumpkin people? Because eventually um, our world will be taken over by orange pumpkin people. I hope not. Um, you know, I have practiced that speech uh, in front of the mirror. Uh, actually, uh, Senator, I believe it's the parents' job to um, to monitor what their children watch. Um, I merely provide content. Um, I, I started practicing that when I was working on um, Happy Tree Friends, but really started to hone it in when I wrote uh, for Mad World. I'm not sure if you're – do you know uh, – I am not seen? familiar with Mad World. Oh, dude. Okay, so what you've got to do is you've got to get on YouTube and um, look at um, look at Mad World uh, uh, narrator uh, dialogue. Um, Warren Graff, who is a writer on um, on Happy Tree Friends, and I um, uh, Happy Tree Friends with me, and I wrote um, the uh, the dialogue for these two ca- these two characters, and it is off the hook. Um, yeah. I need to check this out. Not not right now, obviously, but definitely later. Yeah, it's um, I'm I'm trying to remember the names of the guys um, who did the the narration. They were um, it was um the guy who, who does Bender, uh, uh, DiMaggio, John DiMaggio. Yeah, yeah, and the guy who who does uh, who did whose whose line is this? Uh, crap, there's a lot of people on whose line is it anyway. Was it the American version or the British version? Uh, I'm I'm looking up um. 
I'm looking at the cast here. Because I know uh, that Diedrich Mater did a lot of voice acting. No, it's not that. Um, oh, come on. Where, I'm on IMDb. Give me... Give me, give me the... Go, Greg, Greg Krups. Krups. Okay. Yeah. He, uh, Joe, Joe DiMaggio, or John DiMaggio played Kreese Creeley, and uh, Greg Krups played Howard Buckshot Holmes. And um, I got to write shit that I've never gotten to write anywhere else for that. Um, the, uh, the Japanese clients came to us, and they, they wanted something that was completely irreverent and X-rated and, you know, just off off the fucking chain. And I, I said to them, okay, so where's the line? And they said, oh, no, no, there's, there's no line. And I said, no, 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 there's always a line. Just tell me where the line is. They said, there, there's no line. And Warren and I kind of looked at each other, and I said, okay, we'll get back to you, and then, then you'll, you'll tell us where the line is. Um, and so we wrote a bunch of stuff. Um, and it turns out that in Japanese culture, um, the line is, uh, there's a, there's a real respect for, for mothers and sisters, uh, especially when they're like blowing the pizza delivery guy and the football team like you do, and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> and grandmothers too. Grandmothers are also off, uh, they're off limits. But if you change it to ex-wife, you can save all of those lines. Um, so we changed all the sisters and mothers to ex-wives. Uh, another line was the Pope, um, and I don't know exactly why, but that was a line. Um, and That's then, so weird. oddly enough, Hitler. <laughs> and I, I, I don't know, Axes of Evil? I mean, that was a long time ago. Um, you know, I don't know. But we couldn't make Hitler jokes. And we couldn't say certain words. We couldn't say cunt. Um, we could say fucking shit and almost everything. Um we couldn't say that, and there were a couple of sexual acts, certain descriptions of combinations of things I think that we couldn't do. But for the most part, you'll, you listen to the, the stuff, and you'll quickly understand that we were able to do pretty much anything we wanted to. Yeah. I need to watch this, like, pretty much as soon as I'm done here. Yeah. Um, what, what Something I want to talk about, because... Some I have noticed. What well, I noticed when I was doing research on your work is that you you're kind of on the you were kind of on the cross with a lot of really important things in terms of animation, and of course reboot was one yeah, of them. Because I may be wrong, but wasn't reboot re, was reboot the first fully CGI like animated show? Uh, I believe it was animated series. I, yeah, it was. Um, yeah, because it and, predated um, to, it predated Toy Story, right? Yes, they did. Yeah, they did. Um, mainframe, those guys are great. Um, I uh, at first, um, you know, we were we were both producing animation at the same time. Um, uh, they were, I think that uh, they were right after us on ABC. So you had Bump in the Night, this crazy stop motion show, and then you had Reboot, this crazy uh, animated show. Um, we both had the same the same sensor. Um, the same woman from BSNP, a woman named Mary Conley. Um, and they had, they did an episode with uh, this character called MC, who was the censor. Um, and that's who that was. Um, if you, if you hunt that up and she says no to everything, I forget what the context was, but um, she was, she was basically our enemy. Um, and so we, we basically bonded over that. And then um, for some reason, after ABC, did they go to another network or something? Because they kept um, doing Cartoon oh. Network. They got picked up by Cartoon Network. Right, because I ended up um, writing uh, writing the final episode of uh, of the TV series, I believe, um, and uh, the one that had that song, um, the end the end game or end cap or whatever it was. Yeah. Uh, it was based on Pirates of Penzance uh, song, Modern Major General, and the funny thing about that is that. Every single word of that script, which I believe has my name on it, every single word was rewritten. It wasn't like they changed some lines or something. I delivered a script based on the conversation that we had had um, and the outline that I submitted and then wrote this song. Um, and they decided that they wanted a different ending, you know, basically just a different story and rewrote every single word. I mean, it wasn't. It wasn't like they rewrote what I did. They threw out what I did and rewrote 
uh, I wrote a whole other thing, but kept the song um, and so kept my name as a writer. Yeah. Um, so uh, there exists a script which is the alternate final episode, you know, which was never produced. Um, but I'm very happy that they did do the, the song because I, I thought the song was kind of cool. The thing that I think is so interesting about that show is that if I was wrong, wasn't it canceled for a while and then they brought it back uh, through Cartoon Network? Or I can't remember. That was that. That wasn't the '80s, but it was close enough to the '80s that it was like a lot of those memories are gone. Because I think what they did, because if I remember, they actually did a they basically they basically took the amount of time that the show had been off the air, and then they said it at a point that many years later. So all of a sudden, Bob is gone, and we're trying to figure out what happened to him, and we're seeing characters who are young, older, because they brought the show back at a future point. Wow, I don't remember. I, I didn't watch every episode. So, I, I, so. I, I vaguely remember, because I was in Panama for about three years. My dad served in the military for about almost 30 years. So I was seeing a lot of these shows. I would, there would be these gaps in the shows. And so I'd be like, what happened for three years? <laughs> I bet that was confusing. Oh yeah, a little bit. Just yeah, they um, the the mainframe guys. Um, I worked with them on on another series after that called um, Battle Planets. War... What's that? Oh, I thought it was uh, War Planets. War Planets, yeah. Yeah, why did I call it Battle Planets? Uh, it had a different. It had a different name in Canada, I think, than War Planets. It had it had two different names, so that might be what's confusing you. I I knew it as War Planets. Um, and that was really fun to work. That's where I met uh, I met Marv Wolfman um, and Len uh, Weine, Ween in on that series. They are, uh, they are such good guys. I've met them uh, a couple times at a couple of different shows. Yeah, it, it, that was that was uh, when I began to work with my heroes. You know, all of a sudden I am I am now a peer of my childhood heroes. Um, and that was uh, that was an interesting and, and cool transition career-wise for me. That, now, what happened to that show? Because I remember it was only on very briefly. Uh, I don't know. I I don't know if they did. They, they did at least thirteen. I don't remember if they did two seasons or or not. Um, I don't remember how it ended. Um, I wrote. Uh, did I write the last episode of that too? Um, I am not sure. I, I have to look it up. Um, but um, I think I think it might have ended abruptly. Um, I I once again I don't remember. I've worked I've worked on a lot of stuff and and I I kind of lose track of it after I stop working on it. Yeah, yeah. For for me, just from outside in, the show looked expensive, and I'm wondering if that was a part of the reason that didn't last very long. I don't know. I mean, all that that CG stuff is, you know, it looks like it it might be spendy. I, that's not that's not my my deal most of the time. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't the night when I was a producer, and um, you know, I had to I had to keep track of the budgets on Gary and Mike because I was when I was directing. Um, although I think my shows went a little bit over budget um, typically because um, I just put that much love in them. Um, but for the most part, um, I'm not involved in that kind of thing. Like I said earlier, keep me away from numbers. Um, well, for the first couple of weeks on, on Gumby, somebody put me in charge of petty cash, and it's like it took me almost no time to totally fuck that up. I mean, I, I can't, you know, I can't balance my checkbook. I forget about, you know, petty cash and keeping track of that kind of stuff. So they took that away from me pretty quick. This meal represents the last of the petty cash. Exactly. See, we know our pop culture reference as well. We just don't know our numbers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so I wanted to... Uh, uh, blah. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I word with the pest of the damn it. <laughs> so, because I know that everybody who's listening wants us to talk about the show, and we've kept them waiting long enough, Happy Tree Friends. Tell us about how you got started on Happy Tree Friends. Oh, okay. Um, well, what's interesting is that, um, like a lot of other people, I first became aware of the show um, because somebody sent me a clip. 
it, you know, it's a viral thing, and somebody goes, dude, check this out. And, you know, I watched it and went, okay, what, this these cute little animals, what the fuck am I, whoa, what? <laughs> um, and I had that moment that you can only experience once, which is seeing Happy Tree Friends for the first time. And I instantly fell in love with the show and um, and started showing it to all my friends and, and bought uh, the DVDs. There were two DVD compilations out. And when I bought the DVDs, I, I looked at, at the back of it and saw that it was um, – it was produced locally that, uh, that, you know, it was San Francisco right across the bridge. And so I, I wrote these guys a fan letter and I got to backtrack just a little bit in this story yeah. to say that almost every cool thing that has happened in my life has been become, has been because I've contacted somebody who I thought was interesting. After um, we made that clay animated film in college, Somebody gave us Art Clokey's phone number and said, you should call him up. And we called him up out of the blue. And one thing led to another, and we ended up working on Gumby. Um, I don't know if you know who Jim Woodring is. Uh, I know the name. I, I've, I know the name, but I don't know specifically what he does. I, uh, genius uh, artist, uh, comic book uh, uh, artist, fine artist, um, uh, man of many talents. Um, he, uh, he had this comic book called Jim back when I was working on Gumby uh, that were these sort of... Um, oh, I've sen- seen his work. I'm looking at it right now. Oh, I've, yeah. I've seen his work so many places. I just didn't connect yep. with who it was. So I, I, I wrote him a fan letter, and um, one thing led to another. We became good friends, and, and he actually designed a bunch of the characters on Bump in the Night. He designed the Closet Monster and, and did a lot of the preliminary illustrations and did the logo and, and all, all sorts of stuff. Um, and I it's because I reached out to this guy who I admired and wrote him a letter time and time again. So flash forward, I'm doing the same thing with the Happy Tree Friends guys. This time I sent him an email because times have changed. And um, I said, hi, my name's Ken Pontac. Um, I've worked on this and that and that. Um, I think you guys are awesome. And they got back in touch with me and they said, dude, you've worked on this and that and that. Uh, we think you're awesome. Let's have lunch. And so we got together and had lunch. And um, we just hit it off immediately. Um and even though we hit it off immediately, I didn't end up working on the show for probably another year. Um, you know, just it, there wasn't basically an appropriate place for me to get into that writer's room at that moment. They didn't really need another guy. Um, everything was running fine. But then things changed, and I got invited to work on the show. And, um, and the first episode that I pitched, I think the first one I worked on was uh, one called Waterway to Go, and there might have been another one, I think Shard at Work, happened before I pitched my first one. And the first one I pitched was um, called Out on a Limb, um, the one where uh, where Lumpy gets pinned by a tree. Um, it was kind of based on um, on uh, the guy from 100 and... Uh, 127 hours? Yeah, 120. I always forget how many hours it was. I know it's 100 and something seven hours. Um and uh, and then, then I was off to the races. And um, that has been one of the most enjoyable, uh, laugh variety, culturally well-known, hated by many, loved by more shows that I've ever worked on. I, I just love the show because it's so, it's so simple, but it it's works simple. so perfectly for what it is. Yeah, yeah, there's basically one idea, which is um, start cute and ugly. Yep. I think I was in high school when I first started watching that, and I think that's a perfect time. I think, like, late high school, early college is a perfect time for anyone to start watching Happy Tree Friends. You remember which one you saw? I, uh, yes. It was, um, I, I don't remember the name of the episode, but it involves an anteater. And, like, okay. the, the, uh, the ant started eating his tongue. Oh, is it is it the one where his tongue kind of goes down into the ant hole, yes. and then they spike it? And yeah, that's a great one. That was just that's for my time. But it was funny. Holy funny. shit! <laughs> yep. We and yep. we pulled it up. Um, we were part of this um, select class where uh, they basically pick certain people in the school and they ask them to basically do like an internship kind of job and get an experience in a different field. I ended up working with, like, one of those really cheesy local film editors who do, like, 
weddings and stuff, and this guy was was a kind of incompetent nutball. Like he actually used, he referenced Pearl Harbor as a good as an example of strong cinematography, and it's like I want to slap you, but I'm working for you, so I can't slap you. Huh. And and it's like. And, like, I would describe these other films, he'd say, oh, those movies are too weird. And it's like, you know what, I'm just going to keep on working and not say a word. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, um, one day we were just, I had heard of Happy Tree Friends that nobody else had. And we were bored and nothing to do, and the teacher was looking the other way. So I'm like, hey, check this out. T- teacher comes by, what's that? Oh, it's just a cartoon. Oh, okay. Teacher looks back, looks away, and we're just dying laughing. Oh, Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that I think that scenario has played out a lot in um, in schools much younger than the one that you were at. Um, I actually um, I, I lecture at um, at high schools um, and middle schools actually, um, and I'll show Happy Tree Friends at middle schools. Um, that's about I mean, that's about as young as I'll go. Um, I I, um, I I certainly wouldn't show it to any preschoolers. Um, I think you'd traumatize them. I mean, it'd be kind of hilarious, but you'd traumatize them. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I love watching the reactions. I always ask um, the kids, okay, who, who here has not seen Happy, Happy Tree Friends? And the ones that raise their hands, I say, okay, I'm going to keep my eyes on you because uh, I enjoy watching that moment. And it never fails. I mean, the cringing and the screaming and the eye covering. At this point, I, I pretty much know when it's going to happen uh, in, in every episode. Now, have you seen, uh, we did a thing called Hate Mail. Oh, Ken, real quick. Um, yes. Touching back on Mad World. Mad you World, said yes. it was a cart- a show that you worked on. Uh, did I, I, and I, I, now wait, I looked at, I saw Mad World, it's like, oh my God, the freaking video game. Yeah, it's a video game. I'm, yeah, I'm, I, I love that game because it's on the Wii, which was like, everyone called the kid system. Yes, right? Like, what the fuck? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry, I, I, I uh, got that wrong, but yeah, it was the video game. I love See, that game. That game was great. Okay, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yes. Freaking, yeah, did, it's like you know, um. Uh, did you know this moment that I that I worked on it. I well, I did not. I didn't realize because yeah. you know it was Jap- It was a um, Japanese production, and that never even crossed my mind. Yeah, yeah. I um, funny the way that 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 gig happened. Um. We were doing a, a Happy Tree Friends video game with Sega, um, and uh, we ended up um, working also with Stainless Games in um, on the Isle of Wight. And um, we're in this meeting, uh, and I'm, I'm you know on the Happy Tree Friends side of the table, and there are these um, Sega producers on the other side, and you know you know here's Patrick and and uh, Marty and you know whoever and blah blah blah, um, and uh, then I go home. And um, one of the producers, a guy named uh, Martin Kaplan, is talking to uh, to this guy uh, named Jeff Kaplan. And Jeff Kaplan happens to be my cousin. Um, and apparently, so is Marty Kaplan, who I had never met before. Are you saying uh, that all Kaplans are secretly related to Ken Pontek? Uh, I'm not saying that, no. <laughs> no. But you're not denying it. Yeah, so... so you know, I had no idea in the room that this guy I was talking to was was related to me um, until a cousin in common said, hey, what you working on, uh, Marty? I'm working on this Happy Tree Friends game. Oh, really? You know, another one of our cousins works on Happy Tree Friends. Really? What's his name? Ken. I just met Ken. He's my cousin? Huh. So anyway, so uh, that actually made the uh, trip to the Isle of Wight with the Sega producer a much more enjoyable, interesting experience than it would have normally been because all of a sudden he's family. And, you know, I can bust his balls and we can, you know, just like have this great time. And um, so anyway, so now I know this this guy. And this might have happened even if he wasn't my cousin, but uh, the Happy Tree Friends game comes and goes. And um, then this game Mad World comes up and they need a couple of writers to do this announcer stuff. And Marty uh, tells the producer of this game, uh, the game, Patrick uh, Riley, um, you know, uh, you should talk to my cousin. He works on Happy Tree Friends. And one thing led to another. And uh, Warren Graff, who a Happy Tree Friends writer um, as well, and I ended up doing all this, the dialogue for the announcers. And it was just, 
I wrote the, the, the entire thing intoxicated, um, sitting in my, the comfy chair I'm sitting in right now, um, with the offspring uh, just, bla- just blasting. That's all I listened to was offspring, um, drinking tequila, and writing the foulest <laughs> things I could think of. Dream job. Right? It's like more, more liquor, buddy, now. <laughs> oh, God, what was it? The, uh, one of my favorite lines from is the very short-lived Clerks the Animated Series. And they were talking about all the businesses that were closing down. And they mentioned some some place, and he had this line that just stuck with me, where he said, Yeah, I remember her. No, no, your credit, your credit, no good. You pay now. And it was like his nostalgia was being told that he had terrible credit and he had to pay right now. You pay now is a phrase that um, that gets around. Uh, we we say that uh, at Happy Tree Friends. I'm not even <laughs> sure what the context is, but but that comes up. Um, you've been here four hours. You pay now. Um, <laughs> it's. Uh, it's part of the culture. You drink nothing but coffee. You paid half. I've actually been told that, as a matter of fact, working on um, the Danger Team pilot, uh, which was really a brutal, horrible experience for the most part. It was uh, sort of my ass rape entry into real Hollywood. Gumby really wasn't that. Um, but the Danger Team, all of a sudden, I was working with a network. I was on the studio lot working with, you know, Hollywood producers and stuff. And David and I um, were coming back from this interminably long, horrible, all-day meeting, and it was like 1 o'clock in the, in the evening, or in the, in the evening, fuck, 1 o'clock in the morning, and we're dragging our ass back from the studio to some fleabag hotel they're putting us up in, and we know we're going to have to wake up at 6 o'clock in the fucking morning to go back there to continue hell. And the door to our, our room is locked. And we're like, what the fuck? And we go to the manager, who is hard to get hold of because it's 1 in the fucking morning. And the manager finally comes over, and he's Asian. And excuse your listener, excuse me to the listeners, but I'm merely quoting what happened to me. Um... The, the studio had somehow not been current on paying. And he says, um, you owe money. You pay now. <laughs> the little thing, you pay now. And he said, oh, geez, can we just get in our room? We'll take care of this. No, you pay now or you you know go in the room. And he was talking the fucking pigeon pig and everything. Scenario. I don't even think he was an actual Asian person. I think he was just a demon sent up from hell, cloaked in fake Asian stereotype flesh to just make it more horrible for us for whatever reason. But, yeah, that that phrase um, that phrase exists. God, this, how was that? Some, this pretentious game called Indigo Prophecy is by the people who made several pretentious games, like Beyond Two Souls with Ellen Page. Uh, there's one moment that I liked in those games before they got before the games went completely up their own ass. And um, there's this moment where you go to this old library, and it's run by this stereotypical old Asian man. And it's like, what the hell? And then you get to a certain point where the cops are, where the cops talking to him, and he says, yeah, I can tell you're putting on an act. It's really not that subtle. And he just switches over and says, fine, fine, fine. You know what? I'm actually from upstate. Uh, that, that whole thing just gets the tourists in, you know? He gets the money. So just do what I got to do. Yep. Did you, uh, have you seen my book, uh, Wacky Raceland? I have, and I love it, and it's so damn weird. And it's I weird. love the insane reaction that people, like the insane split reaction that we've seen. Yeah, I tend to generate that, you know? Yeah. Uh, and and I love that. I actually, I'm, I've said it, like, my entire professional life, that um, I like to have about, 80% love me, maybe 75%, uh, 80 is a little greedy, but 80% love me, 20% hate me. Um, the worst thing that you could possibly have is somebody just kind of going, meh. Um, and, and I think I've, I think I've managed to have 
a higher percentage of people love me than hate me. I I freaking love the series, and I mean the fact that. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Didn't the same person who designed the a lot of the vehicles also work on Mad Max Fury Road? Uh, he did. Yeah, the the guy who did the the initial des- designs. Um, I'm drawing a blank at his name at this moment. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, that uh, that helped sell the show. Yeah, that that book is just completely so. <laughs> out there. I love it. Yeah, yeah. It um, it was fun to be able to get that weird. Funny story about that, actually. Um, the uh, the first the first issue, um, I'd written I'd written two comic books previous to that in my life. One of which was published, and one of which um, is a script in a shelf or uh, you know, on the shelf somewhere that I got paid for, but will never be produced. Um, the first one I wrote was a Justice League um, uh, Adventures, I think, uh, or Unlimited, or whatever. Uh, the comic book based on the animated series based on the comic book um, that I did uh, many years ago, and then um, then this one, and uh, I wasn't sure what I could or couldn't get away with, and you know, like I always do, I, I write what I want to write, and then I wait to get notes from the censor or whoever to tell me what I have to cut, um, and you know, I I found out that I I can say ass hat, but I can't say asshole. And I can say ass as far as somebody being an ass, but not an ass referring to somebody's ass. Um, and it's always um, a weird censorship, and that's a weird common censor note among a lot of things I've found. It's very strange. So, so, and you know, certain, certain amounts of blood and stuff. So I, I address all the notes that I that I can on the first issue, and kind of fight to keep a couple of things which which I got to keep. And then the second issue, I kind of get the same amount of notes, um, and I'm, I'm basically trying to get as much stuff past as I can again. And then the third issue, I I get I get no notes, no notes, and uh, and I thought, well, that's that's strange. Um, and and my my editor said, um, yeah, the, the the strangest thing happened. Uh, I I submitted the script for the the third issue, and I I got no notes. And I said, uh, well, that, that is strange. Do you think I just wore the guy down? And she says, you know, I think he might have. I think he might have. He, uh, he, I asked him about that, and, and he said, um, you know, I was just kind of counting the, the amount of times that, uh, the amount of bastards in the script, and I just thought, what am I doing? And, and I, <laughs> I, thought, I thought, what am I doing? Context never change. Or if you thought, what am I doing? I'm, I'm counting the amount of times somebody writes bastard in this thing. I mean, I, I don't know what, what limit uh, I had some finally reached with the guy, but from that point on, I didn't get any more notes, ever. It was great. That means you won. It kind of means I won. Yep. But then the book only ran for six issues and, and then got canceled, so I guess I lost. Yeah, but you still wrote one of the strangest comics to come out in the last year. So I, I think I did. I think I did. The whole the whole Hanna Barbera thing, the whole Hanna Barbera DC thing has been such a cool. I hate to call it an experiment, but it really feels that way. Cause well, you, it's working. I think. Yep. Because I just read Scooby. I just read Scooby Doo, uh-huh. and I'm going to be picking up Flintstones pretty soon too. Flintstones is the best of the bunch that I've seen. That's what it's, I've it, heard. Yeah, it's it's better than my book. Um, I mean, my my book is great for what it is, um, but it is the Flintstones is deep. Um, it's deep and it's woke and it's all those things. I mean, it, and it's it's so relevant to right now. Um, I just have the highest regard for it. Uh, yeah. We had a uh, Chris Burnham from uh, Officer Down, the artist for Officer Down by Joe Casey. We oh, had yeah, him yeah. on the show. And that was a big part of our conversation, was just us talking about how much he loved the Flintstones comic. Yeah, great. But, you know, I just I just watched apropos of almost nothing except for the fact that you mentioned Officer Down. I just I didn't even realize that a movie had been made about that um, based on the comic. Yeah, it fell it went completely under the radar. It was so weird. Yeah. You know, it was not that great a movie. Yeah. Um, it I think that was one of the reasons. Um, it had its moments, uh, but it. Um, it worked better as a comic, and they didn't really change anything 
from the comic to the movie. I mean, the comics were practically a storyboard for the movie, um, written written by the the same guy who wrote the the book. Um, and uh, it just it just didn't work as well for me. I think it's one of those things where a lot of people, and it's for me, for me the big. I get a lot of flack for this from fans of the Harry Potter franchise. Uh-huh. Because I'll point out to them that, in my opinion, the first two movies are the worst. Huh. And they get mad at me about it. And I ask me why. And I tell them, when their big defense is always that it's so accurate to the book. And I point out that that's the problem. You're not adapting for another medium. You're taking what worked on one medium and forcing it into another. And also, I think the first Harry Potter book, I remember when I read it, thinking, you know, this this person is not that great a writer. Um, there, were, there were some things that just seemed clunky to me um, and, you know, just some dialogue things. And it's, I don't, it's been a while since I've read them. But then, then they got really good. Oh, yeah. And if I were to reread the first one, I might change my opinion about that, um, probably based on the fact that I enjoyed the, the whole series so much. Because, you know, even though I, I had a few issues with the first book, I read them all. I mean, as soon as they came out, I would, I would, you know, gobble them up. Um, and she just got, she got so good so fast. And same in the films. Like, it really did feel like, in a way, that the films followed that same progression of her storytelling as a writer. Which mm-hmm. is weird, because you don't normally see that in adaptations. But it really did feel like you were, wa- you were watching her words come out on screen, for better or for worse. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, uh, with that, uh, there is one more thing that I wanted to touch on before we brought the show to a close, and that was Clay Fighters. Oh, Clay Fighters, yeah. I freaking love that game. I love I love the Super Nintendo version. I was not as big of a fan of the N64 version. I don't know why. Uh, I might be able to shed some light on that. Um, so, uh, let's see. I'm, I'm just I'm collecting my thoughts. Um David and I had done some work for Interplay, uh, who was the uh, the um, the developers of the, game. the developers of the game. Yeah, um, we had done some work with them on a show, uh, uh, not a show, a uh, a game called Harley's Humongous Adventure, um, which uh, had uh, stop motion uh, animated characters that were then converted into sprites. Um, and you know, pretty clunky resolution. Um, the the you know the characters, uh, the character of Harley didn't work that well. Um, but what we discovered is that some of the boss bugs. The bigger the bigger the enemies, the cooler they looked as clay animated sprites. Uh, you started to get some modeling and some some textures that you didn't get in in other mediums. At that at that time, of course, um, and it was an interesting look. And at the same time, Clay Fighter was starting to become a pretty popular phenomenon. And so uh, the guys at Interplay thought a clay animated fighting game with really big characters would be pretty cool. Um, and they approached David and I, and we said, "Yeah, that would be very cool." And we came up with um, with the first uh, the first game. With um, the what what they did was really kind of interesting because um, they gave us a um, a like a pirate copy of uh, of Street Fighter that you know wasn't supposed to even be in the United States at the time. I think Statue of Limitations have has gone far enough. Like can, I can mention this, so we're we got this contraband in our hand and we start playing we start playing Street Fighter, which I had never played before, and we got we got really good at it. Um, and really enjoyed it and thought, this, this thing is crazy. Okay, what can we do that would be similar but goofy? And uh, so, like, Taffy Man was, was based on, um, oh, who was the character, uh, the Indian guy? Who, uh, Dawson. Who, Dawson, yeah. He, he had the kind of Dawson moves. Um, and Bad Mr. Frosty kind of had the Zangief things going on. Um, and, you know, it's because these characters are all, are all kind of archetypes of, of you know physical and and cultural things anyway, um, and so we kind of turn turn those things into clay characters, and a lot of them we that we came up with never made the cut. 
certainly didn't make the cut in the first one. Um, Bad Mr. Frosty was a classic. He, he's been, I think he was in every iteration. Um, Taffy Man was really fun to work on. And so anyway, we, we came up with these characters and, um, and, uh, basically would discuss the kinds of moves that we were thinking about with the guys, um, kind of even physically act them out, um, maybe do a couple of keyframes to show them. And then we were off to the races and we, we just created the animation, um, you know, like we we're shooting stop motion animation, but with many, many less frames than normal. Um, and always coming back to, uh, to a rest cycle and, you know, doing all the things that you need to do when you're doing, uh, game animation. Yeah. And um, then we worked very closely with a programmer there to sequence the moves in, in ways that made sense. And that might be why in subsequent games, your experience was not as fulfilling. Even though the animation was better and the resolution was better, um, in the second Clay Fighter game, um, we actually farmed... We did character design um, and kind of uh, oversaw the production, but we farmed it out to uh, another producer friend of ours, and and so that animation kind of was not under our umbrella as much as it was for the first one and the third one, um, which we actually shot in Dan at Danger Productions as we were wrapping up Bump in the Night. And so as far as the technology and the animation quality and just everything. The third game should have been the best one, but when we finished delivering the animation assets and sent them off to, um, um, who would it have been? Um, Nintendo, I guess. Well, I know Nintendo was the was distributor, well, not the distributor. I know Interplay worked on both of them. Yeah. I guess it. I guess it was interplay, but there was somebody else involved because um, I don't remember even working with interplay or talking to those guys on the third one. Whoever we passed the animated assets off to, uh, we said, okay, so we're, we'll send an animator over to make sure everything is sequenced correctly. And they said, no, no, we we can handle that ourselves. Oh, and we got the animation when we saw the, the finished animation. It was like, oh, dude, no, no, you should no, that should have been. There should have been two frames of that, and then it should have, you know, we knew exactly what it should have been, and it wasn't that. And so the animation ended up looking kind of clunky um, as far as the sequencing. I honestly don't remember what it looked like visual quality-wise, although I have to assume it must have looked better on, on still frames. Um, yeah, but, that, that was the thing, because I remember looking at, the art, looking at the back of the box and what it was. It was a perfect example of the back of the box looking awesome. And then I yeah. sat down to play it, and it's like, what the hell happened? Yeah. Um, part of it, I, I, I would have to assume, was because the animation was not ultimately sequenced in the way that it was designed. Um, because of, of, you know, all of a sudden we were no longer involved with it. Um, I, remember, uh, I remember the character design was, was awesome, though. I mean... The uh, if you should you should uh, friend me on um, on Facebook actually, and then you can you can grab frames of um, behind the scenes stuff from Bump in the Night and um, and uh, Clay Fighter on a couple of albums that I have there, um, and it, it shows every aspect of of the design process um, that it might work well with uh, with what you end up putting uh, together for this interview. Yeah. There was a character that actually that we produced. I don't think he made the cut. Um, there was a, a hobo character. Yeah, ho hobo cop. I was actually reading about that. Yeah, yeah. Hobo cop never made, made the cut. And we did all the animation for him and everything. Um, I think he was deemed um, offensive. Even though what the, is the offensive about a homeless vigilante that consumes alcohol, sir? I'm sorry, but homeless man is the best superhero of all time. He's fighting I, crime wherever he might be that day. 
Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, wasn't there, like, uh, the whole movie? Wasn't there a hobo with a shotgun? I love that movie. Yeah, I got it. Hauer. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, Canada. I Actually, I found, we we did a character who I, I argued against at the design stage, um, Kung Pao, who was the, the total Asian stereotype with the bull haircut and, you know, the buck teeth. And it's like, and I don't know. No credit you pay now. Oh, yeah. I mean, honestly, I, I I would be amazed. I'm amazed that we didn't give him a you pay now kind of line. Maybe he might have had one for all I know. They, they have some good voice talent uh, on that. I think I think maybe Jim Cummings um, and Rob Paulson might have worked on those games too. Yeah, I was reading about it. I was reading about it when we were kind of getting ready because I love the original game. And I'm, and it's like Frank Welker, Tress McNeil, Rob Paulson, and it's like this great talent and it's like what the hell <laughs> yeah yeah one one last story about about rob and 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 jim i mentioned that um when i i worked on mighty max you know i had no idea they were going to be doing the voices of these characters um and uh not long after that because um, i was doing mighty max because of bump in the night and mark saslov um we were casting for voices for for uh the lead characters and Ginny mcswain uh, was our voice director on that uh, fabulous woman um, her uh, her business card read strong opinions for every occasion or for all occasions and she um, she had everybody in town. She, Mark Hamill came in Sally Struthers uh, read for Molly um, Frank Welker was in there um, Jim Cummings Rob Paulson just everybody was reading for the parts and I didn't know who any of these people were you know this was my entree into um, you know, animation, uh, series animation like that. I worked, worked on Gumby, but that was a whole different, you know, Art Cloakey and, and his wife did the voices. It was, it was a, it was real kind of family amateur hour time for, for the voices for that. Yeah. Um, but all of a sudden I'm in the room with these people and one by one we're, we're kind of working them down and it ended up with Jim Cummings being the voice of Bumpy and Rob Paulson being the voice of Squishy. And this is after a week of, of auditions people reading the sides. Um, and Ginny smiled at the end of all of it, and she said, I could have told you at the beginning of the week that you'd end up with these two as these characters, but you really needed to discover that for yourselves. And I thought that was just like the most beautiful lesson, and it was so so wise of her to let us do that rather than just to to the guys. Um, but she knew. And they, they really were the guys, too. They were the perfect voices. Uh, I, I I still think that that is one of the best buddy team friendship shows uh, ahead of its time. I think if we had come out now and um, we weren't in a position where ABC uh, got bought by Disney and our show got canceled anyway, I think that if that show had come out now, we'd be a huge fucking hit. Yeah, because it seems like really in many ways we've kind of hit that second renaissance in animation because all the people who love these cartoons are making their own shows now. And that's why we get shows like Gravity Falls. That's why we get shows like Korra. Um, that's why we get all these really cool shows that really bring the t- that really carries that same kind of terms as the shows that we grew up watching back in the 90s and the 80s. Yeah, I've, I've, had, I've had many people come up to me at this point saying, dude, you basically you know, wrote the script for the cartoons of my childhood. Uh, to the point that there's a show I worked on called Slug Terra, which was a, uh, a Disney um, Disney show, um, action adventure. And I uh, was writing um, a multi-part episode, uh, a multi-part kind of arc with uh, another writer. And uh, I did episode one of the arc, he did episode two. And he said, I've got to tell you that... Um, that your episodes of Mighty Max were what inspired me to become an animation writer. And I felt very humbled and kind of old at the same time when he told me that. Uh, but it really made me feel good. Well, and, it, and it says a lot that, like, because I've, I've, I've talked to a number of people who've worked in writing and animation, that a lot of them kind of kind of drop off from it at one point or another, and you've continued to work in it. And that says a lot. I, I feel that says a lot about the way you work and the work that you, and the stuff that you've done. Yeah, well, I, 
I don't really know how to do anything else. Um, I'd be the first person they ate on the island after the plane crashed because uh, I have I have no actual you know survival skills, and my my hands are as soft as uh, as kid gloves because I don't do any honest work. Hey, but you're not a professional soccer player. <laughs> That's true. Although I'm I've been told my ass tastes delicious. <laughs> God. <laughs> <laughs> Well, on the note of your ass being delicious, what's, where can people find you on this wonderful, wonderful place called the Internet? Uh, you know, I I have been told for many years I, I need I need to get my own web website. Uh, I need I need to get my own page, and that is that is pretty much true. Um, you can find me on IMDb. Um, you can find me on Facebook, but if you want to find me on Facebook. Um, Please, uh, please send a friend request and a message that goes with it, because if you just send me a friend request, you'll end up in the hundreds of people who send me a friend request who I don't know, who don't say who they are, that I ignore, because manners, um, you know. Uh, I hope this interview counts as a message. <laughs> oh, absolutely, yeah, without a doubt. Um, aren't we already... Yeah, we haven't we already been talking on Facebook? Um, yeah, we were talking about on Facebook. I, I was joking though; I was kidding. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Tell tell me you heard me here. Um, let's see where else. Those are probably the the, the two best places. Um, and if you want to give me work, um, contact my agent uh, Jason Dravis at the Dravis Agency. See, and that's the best part of that's the best kind of contact. Absolutely. Um, and and I'll be sure to answer your call, especially if it involves large sacks of money, mm-hmm. like cartoonish sacks of money that have dollar signs on them and are brown. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. So with that, why don't we bring the show to this the show to a close? Um, Ken, it was great having you on. This has been this has been a trip down memory lane, man. This has been really really fun. Yeah, yeah. It's it's been fun as well. Um, and I like an interview where. I know right off the bat I can pretty much say anything I want. And that is our show, because we're awesome. You are awesome. <laughs> uh, and I look forward to, uh, to hearing and seeing, I guess, the final, um, final end of all of this. Yep, the end of all this. The uh, end of all. And, and I mean that in a much broader sense than, than your little uh, webcast. You know, I, I'm talking about the end of all of this shit, man, because I've had it up to here. Well, you know, if we hear... Um... If we see, um, ah, oh, oh God, freaking brain spaced out, man. If we <laughs> see, if we see Peter Sellers playing three roles and a nuclear explosion and a man in a cowboy hat writing a nuclear bomb, we will have all known why. That is my favorite movie, by the way, of all time. Same here. Excellent. All right, my brother. Uh, I, I know we get each other in that case. Um, thanks. This has been fun. It has been fun. You have a great night, man. You too. Bye. Bye. You've been listening to Circuit 42, brought to you by Dragon's Lair San Antonio and Gotham Newsstand. Join us for our next episode. For all things geek. Circuit 42.